It's now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Patrick Minford of the Cardiff Business School. Patrick's been taking on the economic establishment in this country for many, many years and coming out on top. He promoted Thatcherite economics before Thatcher. He supported that uh, marvellous 1981 Geoffrey Howe budget while 364 other economists, including, by the way, Mervyn King, wrote to the Times calling for a U-turn. He opposed shadowing the Deutschmark and joining the ERM. After a rejection from the ERM, he became one of the Chancellor of the Exchequer's six wise men. I think we've got half the wise men on the table here. <laughs> Most importantly, Patrick, you've consistently argued that Britain would be better off out of the European Union. You've produced two editions of Should Britain Leave the European Union? An economic analysis of a troubled relationship. During the Brexit campaign, you were a prominent member of the Economist for Brexit group. You got banner headlines in the national press for saying that predictions of recession if the UK votes to leave the EU are based on bizarre assumptions. <laughs> there cannot have been many occasions in your life when you have been proved right so quickly. <laughs> Patrick is now chairman of Economists for Free Trade who wish to leave the European Union and are prepared to trade without an agreement, if, if necessary, as Roger Bootle has re referred to. Um, Patrick maintains that the UK will indeed achieve greater and stronger economic growth in the medium term by trading under WTO rules. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome a great economist and a great support of our cause, Professor Patrick Minford. Thank you very much, Barry, for those very kind and um, far too generous words. I, um, I'm delighted to speak, and uh, I'm, I'm speaking after Roger, who, 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 who said, many things that I totally agree with and so I'll kind of, you can think of me as a footnote to Roger <laughs> and a sort of pre-note to Tim, who, uh, who, who, whom I also agree with on so many things. So, um, the, what I want to talk about mainly is this whole business of what happens if, if we don't get an agreement with the EU, which uh, has been explained today is a highly probable uh, um, event, um, essentially for political reasons, because the economics mean that the EU really ought to reach an agreement with us, as I'll try and explain, but the politics, as Roger has eloquently explained, may be rather different. So I think we have to prepare ourselves for that, and <clears throat> um, what I really want to, to say here is, 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 in, is in two parts. The first is that what we really ought to be doing is striking free trade agreements with everybody else. Because this is the key to the environment that will be the background to our discussions with the EU. And give us the most, give, give them the greatest incentive to strike a free trade agreement with us, as I'll try and explain. So, but the first thing is that actually the whole point of leaving the EU from a trade point of view was to get free trade with the world. And, you know, people then said, oh, but you're going to lose free trade with the EU, and this is tragic. But that, of course, is completely wrong for, for reasons that Roger hinted at, and I'll kind of underline again in, in a moment. I, the, the key point about free trade with the rest of the world and all these free trade agreements is the big thing that free trade agreements deliver to you is access at low at, at no tariffs, with no barriers, of, of other people to your market. Why is that the greatest thing? Because what it does is it puts pressure on your own producers to be competitive, and it delivers gains to your own consumers, because they then 
are paying world prices for, for what they buy instead of these heavily protected prices that the EU has, has, has made us charge to the rest of the world effectively, uh, to our own people, on, the base, on, on top of what the rest of the world sells us. Because of course what protection does is it takes the world price and adds a big, a big wodge of protective margin on top. And in the case of the EU, that wodge is 20% on our food and 20% on our manufacturers. That's a whole fifth extra that goes straight on consumers. Now, of course, it's also true that if you do these free trade agreements, you gain access to other people's markets, and people make a lot of that, and I think politically it's important. But actually, economically, it's not a huge deal, because what happens is you get a better... You get a margin in the country that gives you the, the access, uh, the lower tariffs relative to other people. But then the people who are edged out of that market by your entry then compete with you in other markets and drive down your margins in other markets. So at the end of the day, actually, the long-term gains from access to other people's markets in these FTAs are pretty nugatory because of that whole process of them displacing you in other markets and, 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 and under, effectively, at the end of the day, you still get the world price for everything you sell because you've got to sell all around the world. So the big, the big gain is actually the access you give to other people to your market. And that's, that's what we would get from free trade agreements with the US, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, the list goes on. But probably most important of all is the US, because the US, on, on the evidence that we've, on prices, is the most competitive supplier of almost everything that we buy in the area of food and manufacturers. So if we gave actual proper free access to the, to the US to enter our market, Cutting, cutting out all those barriers the EU puts on them in terms of completely arbitrary standards which don't improve consumer welfare at all, but are simply designed to stop competition with their own f food industry or manufacturing industry by artificial, artificial standard methods or non-trade, non-tariff barriers. On top of the tariff barriers, if we get if we get rid of those on the US, the US, as almost at a stroke, will bring our prices down to world prices. Just the US agreement. And then, of course, uh, by all means, let's do free trade agreements with, with Uncle Tom Cobley and all, and bring them down maybe a little, a little bit more. But fundamentally, <coughs> the US agreement is, is the key to unlocking free trade in this country. And what then is the consequence of doing that? Um, well, it, it means that we get, we get huge gains to our economy because of a 20% fall in these traded prices to consumers. And as I said, extra competition for, for our already vigorous manufacturing and food industries which will, 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 will induce them to raise productivity, which they have been doing massively over the last four or so decades anyway. And they'll just do more because, of course, you stimulate people like that, and firms like that, to, to raise productivity, and they can. They will, they will then do it. And we often forget that a lot of these industries already export to the world market on a massive scale. I mean, over half of the... Of, of, of the um, over half of the exports of the car industry, for example, are not to the EU, but to the rest of the world. So they're quite able to compete and cope with this sort of pressure. As Roger said, they've got all sorts of challenges which they're having to deal with anyway, and this is just another one which they can, they're well able to deal with, in my opinion. So that, that's, the, that's the immediate gain to us. And there's another game that comes with that, which is which which Roger referred to, which is EU suppliers that supply to us in our market will now have to compete with these supplies 
from the rest of the world at world prices. So they'll have to cut their prices to us. That's, that's what leaving a customs union and striking free trade with the rest of the world, in this case the US would, as I said, be proxy effectively for the rest of the world. That's what it does for you. And what it then means is that at the moment we have this very big trade deficit with the EU and that's a, a, a trade deficit of 100 billion and about 20 billion of that is pure gravy to EU suppliers because they're able to supply to us at inflated prices. And because they sell more to us at these inflated prices than we sell to them, the net cost to us of that gravy is that 20% gravy is 20 billion. So once we open up our markets to the rest of the world, and as I say, the key thing here is the US trade agreement, that that 20 billion that the EU gets from us for, 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 for due to this protection against the rest of the world disappears and we improve our welfare by 20 billion a year and our balance of payments by 20 billion a year by doing that. So you can see it's really important for us, for, for Liz Trust, to go out there and do these trade agreements, particularly the one with the US, because it, it then gives us those direct gains. And now I come to the second bit, which is what does it do to our relationship with the EU? Well, first of all, as we've seen, the first of all, the EU realizes it now can't charge us these, <coughs> these heady prices that it currently charges us because of this protection against the rest of the world. So what about the trade agreement? I mean, that's going to happen anyway, whether we have a trade agreement with them or not. But 20 billion improvement in our balance of payments at their expense because of the, they won't be any, any more be able to, to price gouge us as a result of this protection. That happens anyway, but what about, what about the trade agreement point? Well, hang on to this point that they now have to compete in the UK market by charging prices that compete with the rest of the world. So that's 20% lower than they used to charge. So they're going to have to lower their prices by 20% to compete. And if they want to sell to us significant amounts, they'll have to continue to compete at those prices. <coughs> so now what happens if we put tariffs, if there's no agreement, as, as I think is, is likely? Then, then um, <coughs> Roger has, has, has explained, I think, quite well, that there's no problem about access as such. In fact, all this stuff about um, non-tariff barriers, anti-dumping, uh, arbitrary standards on us that we can't meet because even though we're meeting all those standards at the moment that the EU imposes, or that they will start to lay all our traffic at the border, all that stuff is strictly illegal under WTO rules. So you can kind of pop that. I'm not saying Nobody would try it on, or that someone might try and put an anti-dumping duty on us on, on the grounds that, you know, we're unfairly competing by, you know, uh, something to do with the environment or our labor standards. I'm not saying they might not try it on, but it will be totally illegal because, as, as Roger has explained, there's lots of countries that sell to the EU, and the, the, the EU obeys WTO rules with them, so it doesn't impose arbitrary standards or say that they've got to have the same practices in their domestic e economy in order to, uh, otherwise they'd be dumping on them, because that's all, all nonsense. I mean, that, that's all, all nonsense in the WTO. In order to get an anti-dumping duty to stick in the WTO, you have to show that somebody is, in some deep way, artificially subsidizing their costs. And obviously, lots of countries have different ways of doing business, and that doesn't amount to artificial subsidy of your costs. You have to prove something very, very, very much more detailed than that, and, and, and they would be unable to do that. So park all that stuff about, you know, um, standards and access and so forth. It's, it's all, that's all nonsense. But of course, the bit that will be there will be these tariffs, because under the WTO rules, um, if we're going to do free trade agreements with people, uh, with other people, we have to have tariffs in order to give them free trade 
access and not have those tariffs. And so fundamentally, you know, it, it limits our freedom of action. If we're going to do free trade via free trade agreements, you will have what are called most favored nation tariffs on, on everybody else, including, of course, the EU. And, and the EU, of course, will have tariffs on us. So what, what happens if we have this deal with these tariffs? The EU will put tariffs on us, which will uh, which which um, we will we will um, have to pay in the first instance. But what will we then do? Fundamentally, what we will do is pass those tariffs on to EU consumers because our industry will be will be pricing itself at world prices. It will be facing world price competition, and its prices will be at world prices, and it won't. It won't reduce what it will take on EU exports, exports to the EU, below world prices, because clearly that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be a competitive possibility. Uh, they, they, they just wouldn't supply it. They'd rather supply the world market or the home market at these world prices, you see. So, therefore, any tariff the EU puts on our exporters will be passed on to EU consumers. And of course, because the EU market's so protected anyway, it'll be passed on to EU consumers and it'll still be cheaper than all the stuff coming in from everywhere else because that's more heavily protected by, by all sorts of non-tariff barriers as well. So we would still sell to the EU but at prices that would include the tariffs they put on us. So we wouldn't effectively pay this tariff. <laughs> it's five billion a year and we, we wouldn't pay it. That's on existing EU tariffs. What about tariffs we would put on? Well, suppose we kept the EU tariff system, which we might. I mean, we, we might reduce it in various ways, or we, there's lots we could do. But no, no, no government, uh, this government and no other, has ever said it would do unilateral free trade and just get rid of our tariffs, which might be quite a good idea, but doesn't seem to be what they're going to do. So they would keep some tariffs, and maybe let's assume for purposes of argument that the tariffs they keep are the existing EU tariffs. That would bring in 13 billion a year in tariff revenue from EU suppliers to us. Okay? And they would pay it to us in the first instance. Would they be able to pass that tariff back on to our consumers? No. Because if they do, it means they raise their prices to our consumers above the competing supplies coming in from, from the rest of the world. And so obviously they wouldn't sell very much if they did that. So they're not going to be able to pass on that 13 billion we charge them to, to our consumers. They'll have to pay it. So this is where the economics of the EU becomes pretty plain sailing in terms of what they should sign. They should sign a trade agreement with us because if they don't, it'll cost them 13 billion a year. Because our treasury will gratefully say thanks for the 13 billion that they will have to pay us and they won't be able to pass it on to our consumers. They'll have to pay it straight into the treasury out of their own pockets. So. It'll cost them 13 billion a year. And if you discount that at a reasonable discount rate, it's 500 billion in present value, which is quite a lot of anybody's money. I mean, and we talk billions here and not millions, but it's still a quite a lot of anybody's money. So it, 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 from the economic point of view, if they don't do a trade agreement, it costs them a lot of money. Now, what about the 5 billion we pay them? Well, of course, we don't really pay it, as I've said. Their consumers pay it, so the EU levies it on their own consumers, effectively, the, the tariffs that they put on, on us. So that's the fundamental point I wanted to make. And um, what it means, from our point of view, is actually, provided we go ahead and make these trade agreements with the rest of the world, we don't actually give a rap about any trade agreement with the EU. And Rogers already mentioned the city. The city has nothing to worry about at all. If they were stupid enough to put um, some sort of protection on city services to 
EU consumers. They would simply be penalising their own consumers of financial services who, who desperately need the city's services. And it would make no impact on the city, which can sell, already does. It's, a, it's the world's leading financial centre, so it would just simply sell more elsewhere to, to replace any, any loss of custom in the EU. So, as, as Roger said, the city is really not not bothered about this. I'm not saying some particular individuals aren't bothered, because obviously some people may have particular bits of business that they lose, but from the national point of view and the city's point of view as a whole, there's, there's nothing there at all. And, and, and a whole business of fishing, of course, is a completely separate issue, and there's no linkage of that with the city, as we've just seen. But fishing is, is, is something where common sense suggests that Obviously, we will be completely sovereign over our own waters. There's really nothing to, to be said here. Since we, since we will have sovereignty over our own waters, all we will do is say some fishing fleets will be allowed <coughs> from the EU to fish up to a certain amount in our waters. And, uh, for, 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 for basically, in return, for, um, for help in selling that into the... EU markets, which we also rely on. So I don't think fish is a, is a hugely difficult issue, in fact, and in a way it's, it's a completely separate one, as I've said. But um, so I think the likelihood is that we will be under these WTO rules for the sort of political reasons that Roger has said. But the key point is that we don't care. And Yes, we do care about fish for the reasons that Roger said, but that's going to be a separate ball game anyway, in which both sides have a strong interest in an agreement and a strong political interest too. Because, of course, if there isn't a political agreement on fish, the whole of Brittany goes into revolt. <laughs> it isn't just Scotland, Britain. So, and Brittany has quite a lot of clout. So, let me just end by echoing what Roger said about tax and fiscal policy. Because I think, in fact, the biggest problems we face are our own, of our own creation. Yeah. It's the Treasury that's saying the Chancellor can't do anything yeah. and hasn't got any money and can't cut taxes. It's the Treasury and the Office of Budget Responsibility who are using what I would call short-termist fiscal rules about you can't have a, a current deficit or all these sort of things. They're completely nonsensical in the long term. What we need to ask is long-term questions about what does our country need in terms of a new competitive environment now we're leaving the EU. And, and, and as Roger said, we need to cut taxes. We need to make our economy highly competitive. And that will bring us growth. On top of the growth we'll get from Brexit itself and the regulative things he talked about. So we've got this great prospect. And long term, that prospect means there'll be more revenue to spend and scope for tax cuts. And also, the tax cuts we make will bring in more growth and very largely pay for themselves. And I think there's every need now to be very kind of bold and long-termist over the budget. Think about tax cuts, think about strategic spending on things we really need to boost our economy and, and our economy's effectiveness and think that this will largely pay for itself through Brexit and through the tax cutting process that will boost our supply side and boost our growth rate. That's the sort of bold thinking that I, I hope very much that Boris will do as he faces this tremendous sort of pushback from, from the, the Treasury and the Civil Service and the Office of Budget Responsibility and so on, all of whom opposed Brexit and were, were were pessimistic about it and produced propaganda saying that trade would collapse and you know the, the problems with Europe are un unmanageable. All of which is total and utter nonsense. But the Chancellor and with Boris behind him have got to resist all this and say no, 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 we, we got the money to pay for it. There's growth, there's growth in the system. Also we need to have an expansionary monetary policy because in the short run we're going to need to deal with the coronavirus short-term effects and we're going to also have to get monetary pops, get interest rates up, get the borrowing up, these very negative real interest rates that we're paying at the moment. So it's a great opportunity for the Chancellor to do that. I mean, with negative real interest rates, lenders actually paying us to lend to us. What's not to like about borrowing and 
pursuing an aggressive fiscal policy that's looking at the long term of the country. So it's not just the EU that's our worst enemy, it's ourselves, as a matter of fact. So I want to say we need to tell the Treasury loud and clear to get behind the people on this and to back and to back bold reforming measures that that play to our long-term competitiveness. 